Okay. Originally, the title of my paper was uh, The Noise of Silence, but then I be became inspired with something the Spanish king said to uh, Venezuelan President Hugo Chavez in uh, 2007 at the Ibero-American Summit in Santiago de Chile. He said, ¿Por qué no te callas? Why don't you shut up? Misrepresentation and vulgar reductionism are increasingly common forms of censorship when, in Europe, a loss of nerve has led to critical judgment being replaced by the tyranny of opinion. In my sculpture that was subjected to censorship at the 2014 Biennale in Sao Paulo and attempted censorship at the Magba in Barcelona, it involved a denial of the history the work explores, the continuum from the colonialism of the past to the present, specifically that of Spain in Latin America, and the involvement of Nazis in the subcontinent's era of dictatorships. Next. In Spain itself, history is re uh, in Spain history itself is re repressed. The voices of the dead of the Civil War, demanding to be heard, have been in effect censored by the right-wing PPP government when, in 2011, it abolished the Office of Victims of the Civil War and Dictatorship, which coordinated the exhumation of the remains of those that disappeared. As an Austrian artist, one is especially aware of the dangers of selective historical amnesia, articulated for us by the writer Elfriede Jelinek when she quotes the brother's grim fairy tale of the obstinate girl in which the hand of the girl keeps growing out of the grave. The obstinate girl even protests against being dead, and thus becomes a metaphor for the victims of genocides, in her case the Shoah, who resist against leaving our cultural memory. We are living on the mountain of corpses and pain, as Jelinek has expressed it. Listen also to the talking knee of a certain corporal Wieland, killed at, Stali uh, killed at Stalingrad, recorded by Nekton Kluge in Die Patriotin, which comes back in order to set the record straight. I have to clear up a fundamental misunderstanding, namely that we dead are somehow dead. We are full of protest and energy. In the sculpture, the alive and the dead are not separated in different roles, but desperately nested into each other so that the moments of overlapping and encounters can be need cannot be neatly confined. The border between the present and history, between the objects and the bodies, between the three bodies are blurred, and what we might see is not several parts, but one. At the same time, in the 1970s, in the 1970s when Juan Carlos I was being groomed by the dictator Franco, to make the necessary adaption of, this, of that state after his death. Domitia Barrios de Chungara was the leader of the Housewives Committee in the Siglo Venti mine camp in Botossi, and after she was invited to attend the United Nations International, International Women's Year tri Tribunal in Mexico, in 1975, she became, she became well known. On December 28, 1977, she joined the hunger strike launched by four miners wife, wives, Aurora de Lora, Nelly de Baniagua, Angelica de Flores, and Luzmila de Pimentel, and their 14 children in the offices of the Archbishop of La Paz, demanding that the government democratize the country, withdraw army troops from the mine regions, and grant unrestricted amnesty to political and union leaders. 
They were backed by priests, workers, students, and peasants who kept joining uh, the hunger strike, and together with the waves of protest that spread through the country, succeeded in forcing the military, military dictatorship of General Hugo Panza Suarez to step down and call general elections. She died in 2012, living to see a democratic Bolivia despite further coups and repression and despite her history of being persecuted, jailed and tortured, she was never silenced. One such coup, that of 1980, was financed by drug traffickers and narco dollars led by colonels Luis Garcia Mesa and Luis Arque Gomez who left a trail of dead and wounded. Paramilitaries recruited by Klaus Barbie were used by the colonel, colonels to help them to take over. Barbie, known as the Butcher of Lyon, reached Latin America with the aid of different points of the U.S. Army Counterintelligence Corps, the Vatican, and the werewolves. As well as being Im implicated in the cocaine arms trade, he was appointed to the rank of a colonel within the Bolivian Armed Forces in, re in reward for having been a lead teacher in torture techniques for Bolivian dictatorships. Eighty million were living in the Americas of the 15th century. By the middle of the 16th, only 10 millions were left. Eight million died in the silver mine of Kutosi alone. Indians, who as Marx described, lived to disappear from the face of the earth. It was the silver that from the mid-16th century bankrolled the Spanish monarchy for the next 200 years kick-started European capitalism and provided what was needed for the extension of European colonialism to Africa and Asia, a commodity desired by its rulers and traders. In the essay, Discourse on Colonialism, published in the early 1950s, Aimé Césaire described the conflict between the colonizers and the colonized. What am I driving at, at this idea that no one colonizes innocently, that no one colonizes with impunity either, that a nation which colonizes, that a civilization which justifies colonization and therefore force is already a sick civilization, which irresistibly progressing from one consequence to another, one denial to another call, calls for its Hitler, I mean its punishment. The Afro-Colombian journalist Rosa Amelia Blumele Uribe has followed up Césaire's outline of the colonialism national socialism uh, continu continuum. The dungeons in the fortresses on the West African coast remind one of the crimes against humanity, much like the remains of Auschwitz do. Slave labor on the sugar plantations of the New World is comparable with the forced labor of the concentration camp inmates. She noted in her 2011 book, White Barbarism from Colonial Racism and Racial Policies of the Nazis, which denounced how the black-skinned victims of colonialism and their descendants are still discriminated against by the descendants of the perpetrators. The bed, the bed of broken German army, army helmets, the figure of the werewolf and the cornflowers, so favored by Hitler and modern-day neo-Nazis, and deputies of the Austrian Freedom Party in the sculpture highlights this uh, historical trajectory and takes it further into the neo-colonialism of now. Hitler used the pseudonym Wolf on occasions 
and werewolf was the name given to a plan which began development in 1944 to create a resistance guerrilla force and on March 23, 1945, Goebbels gave the werewolf speech in which he urged every German to fight to the death. At the end of the war, werewolves were used as part of a Nazi underground railroad, facilitating travel al along escape routes, the so-called Red Line, used by Nazis like Barbie. The sculpture belongs to the long-term and ongoing investigation Blue Shuttle's Wall Ball, which explores the complex relation of cloth, clothing, and colonialism from earlier to contemporary forms of globalized, uh, globalization, and specifically is part of an installation containing many parts, among them a cloth design. On the cloth, one can see present-day human load carriers from all parts of the world in a network of armed tunnels with caves where golden eggs were piling up. The cloth was made into bags, which tried to find a critical expression for the reality behind the modern-day use of David Ricardo early 19th century law of comparative advantage. The law is a piece of dismal conjuring, of dismal conjuring suggesting, suggesting free trade is good for everyone when there was never anything free in a time, at the time in a world of invasions, colonies, and slavery and when today bilateral and regional trade agreements between the more and the less powerful are the norm. Free market ideology serves to re-legitimize colonial hierarchies and from a North European point of view, decolonization in Spanish America means basically access to Western capital to markets, investments on the cheap, cheap raw materials, and its financial infrastructure. My work was aimed at contradicting neoliberalism's neo constant response to the crimes of uh, colonial exploitation. Oh, that was then. And especially the role of Spain in Latin America then and now and now, in which Banco Santander is the dominant banking network at the continent, not insignificant when it is finance capital that is the orchestra of neoliberalism. In the 1990s, Spain became the biggest, the biggest foreign investor in the continent after the US, faced with both increased competition within Europe and seeing the opportunities presented by the Latin American debt crisis. Spanish companies snapped up privatized cash-strapped uh, Latin American banks and utilities at fire sale prices. Since the 2007 uh, uh, crisis, Spanish investment and revenues from the continent have increased three times. It has been called the reconquest and involved the marketing campaign led by ex-King Juan Carlos, who was a constant visitor on the continent. Now and then, it hit the headlines when the king, using the two form as if to a child, told President Hugo Chavez to shut up. The boiling point for Juan Carlos was when Chavez, with some justification, called Spanish Prime Minister Aznar of the BB party and enthusiast for the Iraqi invasion of 2003 and former member of the Falangist Youth, a fascist. Not coincidentally, the shut-up came at a time when the neo-colonial expansion of Spanish was running into Latin American demands for re-nationalization of utility and energy companies on the grounds that they were being asset-stripped. Since then, such renationalizations in the face of Spanish diplomatic pressure and threats have taken place in Bolivia and Argentina. 
And the wolf is still present, as it is shown by an attempted coup in Venezuela and the modern coup d'etat carried out in Honduras and Paraguay, in which democratically elected governments were ousted without overt military violence by the power of money and its media and elicited no condemnation from the West. This is the now. An artist should not have to explain her or his work, but in this instance, faced with prurient misrepresentation, self-interest, righteousness, and of what I would call the tyranny of lazy opinion, an account of what has gone into the work seems to be necessary to counter what I believe are the unstated but real limits of what art is allowed to do, and which constitutes the censorship that has become prevalent in the world of neoliberal monologue. Thank you so much for that uh, very nice lecture. Do you have questions, comments? Yes. Sorry, Deutsch or English? English, okay. I don't. I don't know if I understand you, uh, studio, right? you talked about attempted censorship in Barcelona and censorship in Sao Paulo. Yes. Until now, I had found that uh, the sculpture had been presented in Sao Paulo. It was presented, uh, it was presented for a few days, <coughs> uh, but after that it received an H label meaning that only people over 18 should be allowed to, to look at the sculpture. Uh, there have been uh, investigations uh, about several works of the BNL um, on the grounds of um, obscenity. Um, and even so, there was nothing in the sculpture which actually pointed uh, at the at the uh, sorry, I'm a bit uh, yeah. Nothing was it was not a legal case. The curators accepted the the H label, and this was followed up by a wall which was erected in front of the sculpture, uh, five meters in height. Uh, and, you know, there are a lot of uh, school classes going to Sao Paulo, so they were not allowed to go behind the walls, so that special tourists, where teachers were asked to go behind the walls, come back to the waiting pupils and uh, describe what they have seen. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful I miss the beauty of that. Uh, <laughs> I don't want to, to, uh, to be discreet, but wasn't there yet another incident which involved more leftist critique regarding the use of Maybe I confused two things, but wasn't there yet another incident regarding the work which involved the dialogue or critique of a more leftist uh, German curator group which had problems with its dealings with Nazi past symbols? So wasn't there yet another yes. controversy which I'm not sure which was played out publicly or not? So you. No, it was not. But actually, one of the curators uh, is present, Max Hilderer, 
so the work was originally commissioned for the Potosi Principal Exhibition, uh, which started at the Reina Sofia in Spain, in Madrid, and moved then to uh, the House of the Cultures of the World in Berlin, and then uh, to the Ethnographical Museum in La Paz. And uh, basically the curators refused to have the sculpture in the show. Max, you want to say something to that? Well, we had a dialogue and we said in the we mind. Have another sculpture or another work. Yeah, but you know, I mean, this is, so this, uh, this culture is, I mean, you know, it's, um, it's very de demanding. It was demanding, um, took a long um, time to produce it. I mean, I was working on that, you know, in tears uh, sometimes over a year. Then uh, it was incredibly difficult because also I'm not a, uh, a sculpturer. You have the three bodies. I never worked with paper mache before, and you know, all kinds of problems um, arose during this, this period. And then it has this history which um, uh, is actually still not finished. This means I still get attacked by all kinds of people. I was accused of being, you know, almost everything. I mean, I think apart from being an anti semit or a gay basher, but you know, I was accused of being sexist, racist, uh, colonialist, uh, and you name it. And uh, uh, one of the last attacks was actually published by um, the newspaper of the biggest artist union in Austria by a group of um, queer Latin American artists. Um, where they basically say I'm uh, silencing uh, down the voice of uh, Domitina, Chungara. So it's it's ongoing. I mean, it's a it's a it's a long story in a way. <coughs> I really thank you about your talk and all this, giving all these background, which is so absolutely important for the work. And I've been kind of like thinking about it for some weeks now, and will present some stuff tomorrow, some of my considerations. Um, and of course, you have said so many things that I haven't even thought about, researched, and so on. I think that's that's something which is special about the work that you really have to. Um, engage in a large, longer research as, a, as an audience, as a, as a viewer, in order to grasp at least a little bit of what you're referring to. Yeah. Um, I have a very specific question concerning um, an aesthetic decision, and you didn't use the, um, the word caricature yourself, but the word has been used um, during the day. Um, as saying it's a caricature or it's a caricature of the um, Spanish ex-king. Um, and I wonder if we read it as a caricature, what does it mean to put into an intimate relation um, a figure you want to um, criticize and dismiss and caricature Juan Carlos and um, Domitila Barrios de Chungara, um, who is a political figure that, if I heard it right, that you actually, um, um, now I'm missing the word, um, bewundert um, and admire. Richard, admire. Um, yes. And so the two are in, put together, and this gesture of the caricature does something with the relationship between the two. And I'm, I'm actually, I really would like to hear more about this decision, um, which creates something which is definitely not something like a simple statement, a simple truth, uh, uh, yeah, a simple statement about the relationship. And it's, it gets doubled. What happens to um, the political admiration towards um, Dumitila in the, in the moment where she is engaged in this um, intimate relationship? You know, when, when, um, when 
The whole thing started actually with this little scarf you have seen at the beginning. You have this uh, indigenous girl from the island of Tequila holding this scarf, which I uh, discovered in the Mercado Central in Cusco, and I was completely surprised because, you know, as an Austrian, you are very sensitive to symbols of, uh, of the Nazis. So I couldn't actually understand what is happening. And um, I started the research, uh, and you know, I also didn't know that this is going to be like a, uh, a nest of furnaces I'm going to stay in. You know, this relation um, between colonialism and, uh, and Nazism is so complex. The history is so um, uh, huge, and also, you know, the present day remains in in in, in uh, Latin America, or you know, the structures which were left over, or the people who are still active. Uh, I mean, you know, you have this uh, secession um, in uh, the south of Bolivia, and a lot of, uh, and you see, you know, cars. Uh, driving around with uh, the swastika and there's a lot of, you know, uh, uh, nostalgia for, a, uh, you know, a big leader. Um, so, this, you know, so you, you, you start to investigate and you, you kind of step into such a complex history and it's very um, difficult to find an expression for that, you know, I mean, of, as you know, uh, uh, Elfriede Jelinek said in her, the, the children uh, of the dead, you know, I mean, they, they want to be heard, so we are all, you know, being on this huge, uh, uh, <coughs> violent history, which um, still, you know, is not done justice. And um, the decision, and you know, I was always, <coughs> trying to not to think this culture as like the three figures. I was always trying to see it also, or mainly as one figure. Because I thought, you know, it's not, you can't simply uh, portray a power reversal, you know, having an indigenous woman topping, you know, the a rep representative of uh, uh, European uh, colonialism, and uh, it's, uh, the, the whole thing is much more complex. This is also when the werewolf came into play, um, and I was very insecure about this figure because, you know, I, I already knew what kind of critique this would be invoking. Uh, so it's not about portray portraying her or the king or you know the wolf, but you know um, uh, 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 ongoing history. And would you use the term caricature if you would talk no, about No, never. Person? I would never use that. Never. Uh, I don't work in this tradition. Um, it came actually up during the whole discussion, I think, in, uh, in Barcelona. Also, maybe, you know, as a, as a way out. I mean, you know, the, this king is not mentioned as a king. I mean, it has, uh, I don't know how this happened because I'm actually not a good sculpture, but it has an resemblance to this king. <laughs> 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 and you know, he was easy. I mean, it was very difficult actually to uh, to 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 have an old female body in this position. Incredibly difficult. And the most difficult, you know, was actually the face. So this was done and undone for many times because you know, it always is. Uh, in the beginning, it always looked like an Indian mask, like a fantasy, you know, one of these European fantasies. So, um, uh, and you know, it was also for me very important not to 
to have that as a sexual act. So, and to have a quietness around it and not, you know, a noise. Um, I don't know if I answered your question actually. Kind of. Kind of. <laughs> yeah. Hello. Um, I just want to say something because I, I think probably, you know, just to leave it clear, um, I think that one of the, of the big uh, challenges of today is to define where censorship starts and, you know, where you can start naming it censorship or not. I'm going to talk about this later. With, um, with Enos and the sculpture, I'd say um, we decided against the sculpture, but um, a wonderful friendship developed out of that. Uh, the intensity of the Potosí project, and we continued collaborating up to today. So, um, yeah, call it censorship if you like. Um, this is what what happened. Yeah. And I honestly, yeah, well, <laughs> okay, I'm going to talk about this later. Mm. Um, can, you, can you say why you didn't take You didn't say why you uh, dismissed that one single word. Can you like uh, explain? Or oh, that word you did? <laughs> so um, it's a, it's a complex process. We were uh, three curators with three different opinions, and uh, let's say the discussion also took uh, place over. Uh, different steps. It's it's very difficult to, to sum it up. Uh, me yesterday uh, was uh, recalling the situation with Ines. Um, I, for my position, I can say it's, uh, and I'm very sorry to say that it's not my favorite work of Ines. And I think uh, she has presented a much nicer work in the <laughs> exhibition for 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 the for the purpose of what uh, of what we wanted. I like it better. It's only a matter of taste. Excuse me? It's only a matter of taste. It's a matter of taste, but, I, but it's a matter of dialogue. It's a matter of creating a space of solidarity. It's a matter of unfolding, unfolding a dialogue. Also, not, I, to be honest with you, I, I honestly don't think that an artist can just do whatever he or she wants. And the curator has to accept it. I think that curating is a process, and as in a process involved, you know, there can be struggles. As I said, um, we might struggle over a sculpture, but you know, we can discuss this, and we can have very productive uh, conversations. And hello. I think, I think in this case it was something else actually. I mean, I was uh, giving reason, um, but in the end my suspicion was that there was a fear of the creators um, about the possible censorship of the Reina Sophia in the end. I mean, and this is also what I was told by Alice later. So, I mean, you know, taste, uh, I mean, uh, uh, and you know, I don't think this was. Uh, I wouldn't compare the three cases actually. I just uh, mentioned it because uh, I want to say that there is a troubled history around this culture now for a long time, and it's ongoing. We um, we were also censored as curators to show our bourbonic crown. Um, so there's different layers of you know. Uh, of an institutional composition, let's say. Yes, and I think that the horrible thing about censorship is that, you know, then it has an effect that you start to self-censoring yourself afterwards. It's, and somehow it, uh, it has an effect on your psyche. And we have to be very aware of that. Um, because, you know, I, Actually, didn't make another work this year because I just thought, okay, I uh, I know you know this will create another excitement, and you know I, I'm just about with my limit, you know, to what I can carry. So, 
this uh, question. Yeah. Hello, uh, thank you for your intervention. Um, I would be interested to know if you made, if you made a, re a response to the reaction of the queer people of color in Vienna. And if you made like a response, uh, what was, what did you, what did you say? Um, <laughs> you know, I did learn about that very late. So this was published in um, in June already, and I only heard about it uh, recently. And um, I mean, there, you know, other. And no, I didn't make the response up to now, and I still think how to do that. Um, there, uh, you know, there is this website of uh, the International, where Mari was also president and stepped back, and they published a series of um, essays, one of them, uh, Manolo, uh, Jorge Rebalto was writing there, and the last one was written by a woman, and she accused the sculpture of being a Trojan horse sent into this museum as um, to destroy it, basically. And the museum was described as, as kind of the last left fortress, um, specifically like, like the word fortress, against uh, capitalism. So, Yes, I will respond. I demanded my right to, of, for a response, and I will uh, send them a modified uh, version of the talk I gave today. But, you know, it's, um, I mean, for me it was very difficult to write this text, because basically, you know, you start to research, yes, and you find, you have these loose threads, you try to tie them together, and then, uh, you know, I don't write text and, you know, make an artwork as a kind of illustration of this research. So, in a way, I try to forget everything, you know, when I start to, to, to move into creating, you know, an object. And, you know, after such a long time to, you know, follow that up, uh, it was rather difficult for me. Because, in a way, I have to, I believe that, you know, the artwork is actually, you know, I fill it up with whatever I know and with my best intentions and, you know, then I like to move on normally and do something else. So this was, yeah. Uh, a question about the, the potential, the first, uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Um, the first time it's going to be displayed and it didn't happen. You know, after such an engagement of the research and emotional, physical, so you were, you, so you proposed the work and then there was other issues. Did you, did you show something else or it was, a, it was like, okay, then I prefer not to show anything. How did you deal with that? Especially after such an intense also. Yes. Um... Well, I was uh, upset, of course. I said, okay, I'm, I'm out of that. Uh, you know, the budget was limited. I think it was 7,000 euros at the time. I thought my budget is spent, you know, I'm, I'm not going to have that. But then, you know, basically we artists are corrupt in a way. <laughs> so I was like, called by by Manolo, he said, please, you know, make something else, uh, we'll give you more money, and I mean, you know, I always have a lot of ideas. So I actually made this performance, uh, you know, where a countertenor in a costume was uh, singing um, uh, 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 con uh, confessionale, confession manual you know, which uh, was given to the uh, priests in the 16th century to... So I did this work, I was very happy with that, and, yeah. But I, say, I just want to say, but for me these are two very, very different uh, cases. I mean, we could discuss what kind of situation that was and if we call that self-censorship or not, but this was, um, this is a completely other thing uh, than if 
you are I'm, I mean you you're invited as a as an institution as a curator uh, to do something and then at the very last moment somebody says no that's not possible in this museum I mean then it is sort of um, I think and I also always would say I, I don't know if I if I could come in these kind of situations you never know uh, but but there is a difference uh, when you have the, the more or less the possibility to react on that, or if you don't have it because somebody says if you don't, I close. That's a completely other thing. I think also this, the, the, in the context of principio to see what I didn't know before is, is a complex one. Yeah? It's, it's not so easy, and case is also not so easy just to, to use that. But but it is for me a completely other. Other situation, and also because you said at the last um, panel that how do you decide in positions, and and I think um, th this you must decide every time. I mean, how far do you go with with uh, not accepting something? Uh, um, so it's that, that's very very complex to say. There is no no standard answer. But you know, I just remembered today actually the. the this is my second show in the Magbar, and the first one was about 10 years ago, uh, was the title, How Do We Want to Be Governed? And it was about governmentality. Rauche was involved in that. It was created by uh, Robert Bögel and Ruth Noack. And in a way, a lot of, I, I think, it's, it's at least my perception, a lot has changed in these uh, 10 years. Um, I think that, what I called the, the monologue of the institutions. It has become stronger. I think it's more difficult for dissident, dissident voices to be heard or to be shown, you know. So the silences, I think it's, um, it's, um, it's something uh, which we have to fight against because um, uh, otherwise, you know, we will stop producing sooner or later, because, you know, it's un it starts to get really unbearable very and very, very narrow. And I thought, you know, this uh, last 10 years, it would be even worse mm -hmm. to look at the history of, I mean, the Makbar is a special case. And, you know, at this time, there was still a lot of hope, actually, uh, connected to it. Uh, with this exhibition, you know, there was suddenly a desire coming out of this museum, you know, which basically people have given up anyway. And, you know, this span, I think it's so interesting. Also, you know, how it reflects what is happening within our societies. And, you know, which I think basically it's unacceptable. And taste in this case is not a question also you know of course it's a question when you create something of course but as such you know i don't think this uh, this is helpful in the discussion about how things changed and, you know still it's ongoing so last but I, question but i also think that the uh who's there <laughs> How come you upset me? <laughs> but I also think that the discussion about censorship is getting too limited if we only think about um, the institutions and the institution yeah. getting more rigid or whatsoever. And I would actually like to take up your question, which was exactly my question too, because there are two things happening. The fact that the um, sculpture is um, exhibited now also provides the space for a critique from other dissident voices which are usually not heard and definitely not heard in the institution and in the big um, media and I think it's it's very important also to think about the question what happens if there is a critique a politically motivated critique like the one saying okay um, I criticize I haven't read the text but it sounds like I criticize the sculpture for um, silencing a feminist voice, um, and I mean this is a critique uh, which is then addressed to you as an artist, and that might also create a situation where you say, okay, oops, shit, um, I actually cannot produce um, simply as I've produced before because this critique actually gets me or whatsoever, and I think that's also part of the 
the question of, um, and this is not a question of taste, it is a question of aesthetic decisions, and also, I mean, even if I'm as a writer, I have this, this moment too, where I write something, I dare to go out into the public, and afterwards there's a critique, and I feel like, oh shit, I shouldn't have written that. Um, and um, I have to stand in for that, and um, I think kind of like what Max said about the question of a dialogue starting before, it might be a dialogue which leads to the decision not to show something, and not as a matter of taste, but as a matter of um, a political analysis of the context of the artwork, its circulation, its distribution, the um, um, discussions it might um, um, provoke. And I think that's, it makes things even more difficult, but I want to be this part of the discussion and not kind of like say, censorship is always something which is kind of like the bad institution up there. It has something also to do with um, discussion within the political movement. No, I just one thing, there is a reaction to that. I, I totally agree with you. But for that discussion to happen, yeah, I, I fully agree with you. But for that discussion to happen, then the work has to be shown. And if it's not shown, if it's never shown, we cannot have the discussion. Mm. Right? And just preventing the discussion to happen, which I think which is, which is the case with this sculpture. And I think that as much as I, I totally uh, like your work and I respect your work and everything, I think that in this situation it was clearly impossible to show this work at the way of it. I think it was clearly impossible because of the, you know, probably was too risky as well for the director and for all of you. And I think that honestly for us, I think that us being in Madrid, we wouldn't have thought the same. But Barcelona, we thought it was a particular situation, and probably the math class one. But of course, we didn't even measure, start to measure, the amount of risk we were taking and the, the lack of power of the director that we had. So basically, you know. But I think that it's, things have to be shown, because otherwise, how are we going to speak about them? I'm also thinking uh, throughout this whole discussion is, why is making us so uncomfortable about this sculpture? You know, it's just like, I'm, I have no announcement myself, but I like us to think about what is like so disturbing about what you made that is like us, you know, demanding all of us to ask you all kinds of things, like, okay, you know, and when, when I didn't tell that story, that I think it was very interesting, that basically uh, in Sao Paulo, finally, the police came to 35, but basically it was like not a sexual act or something like that, right? And it, it's very interesting as well that the way of uh, um, censoring the, the sculpture in uh, Sao, pa Sao Paulo was as obscene or pornographic and then giving these advice of basically cannot be seen by people below or 18, right? So what is really annoying us so much about it? And why is it so disturbing? Because we could, I think that the same discussion that we're having about her sculpture could be done with any of the works that we have inside. All of your works really work, I mean, your work, your work, all of them, they are confronting issues that have to do with the power state, national identity, the incarnation of power, uh, the military power, monarchy, all those things in a kind of subtle and complex way that in a way you are entangled with the issues that, you, that you're trying to criticize, that you're not outside, whatever you are. It's like, in your case, for instance, I'm thinking about your work, and there's no show here, but it was in Barcelona, that's basically this erotic relationship to power, that basically, right, that is happening within the dictatorship and the relationship they have to religion and all those things. So, I think that there is something underlying this sculpture and many of the works of the, of the exhibition as well that is making all us really uncomfortable and that we don't know exactly how to discuss. And that maybe it's, instead of just like thinking about censorship, and so maybe we should get to, get to that and to see like a why, you know, we're pointing like, a, okay, um, we really need to know what is really happening behind the sculpture. Mm -hmm. You know, when, when I finished the work, I was actually so proud because I thought, <laughs> you know, 
you have such a responsibility as an artist, you know, you have audience, uh, you try to kind of picture um, something which is so difficult to visualize. And you know, you, you try to be good enough. And I thought, you know, I took, you know, the horrors, the horrors, the crimes of colonialism, of what is happening now in these countries. And I thought, ah, finally I managed, you know, this is, you know, um, so, you know, I was a bit surprised by this uh, uh, strong reaction. I thought, yeah, maybe, you know, we all been, have been very naive, but I was completely um, shocked um, uh, by the reaction of Mari. You know, what she said before that she had to step down. I mean, because of the censorship, he had to step down because he basically did a bad crisis management, I think, you know, because this was not kept silent. And I think um, we talked about that outside. I mean, this has to be also seen as a victory. I mean, the exhibition was opened under this uh, impossible circumstances. And this was, you know, you can see that uh, there is really a power in solidarity and I mean this would be also a reason you know to to celebrate or rejoice or we shouldn't you know forget about that this was for tomorrow because it's a work on Sundays um, and I think we, we should then there will be all this and then we need, to, we need a little technical okay okay little <laughs> Let's see how it goes.